So good day, everyone, and welcome to yet another history hour organized by Xavier Center of Historical Research, Porvorim, Goa. We have among us a brilliant, well-traveled mm -hmm. writer and speaker who will speak to us on the efforts of the indigenous farmers to nurture agro-biodiversity in Laos and what lessons can we all pick from them. More about the speaker in a bit. I now request the director of Xavier Center of Historical Research, Father Anthony Da Silva, to formally welcome all of us this evening. Good evening to all of you and very welcome to this evening's program. We are very delighted to have with us Andrea Rodericks, who is our main guest and our main speaker too. And as Father Anderson said, he will say more about her a little later. But I cannot welcome you without a reference to her work and to what she's going to talk about this evening to us. Savior Center, as you know, is a, is a place where history is studied and is a place that uh, passes on this history to its scholars and readers, friends and patrons. So you might wonder how this topic of this evening connects with history because it's speaking about biodiversity, speaking about biodiversity in Laos, which is a faraway country from India and definitely from Goa. But nevertheless, we thought this is a fascinating topic and Andrea Rodericks will explain it to us, of course, in very enchanting terms so that we understand the basic message. What I think is very insightful for us at the History Center about this talk is this quotation that I found in the book of Andrea, and it is a quote she has taken from Anthony Bourdois, who you know was a celebrity chef from the United States, and he was well known for the manner he presented his foods across the world, and also well known for his travels across the world, whereby he would connect food with the history of the people. This is very fascinating. And that is exactly what Andrea is doing, going to do, I think, today, this evening, because her book, which she has just released, entitled Living Landscapes Embracing Agrobiodiversity in Northern Laos, speaks to this. And I'll give you this quotation from Anthony Bourdois, because it summarizes very well, I think, what we are going to experience this evening. He says, the history of the world is on your plate. The history of the world is on your plate. All food is the expression of a long struggle and a long story. Very beautiful. And this evening, we are assembled here to hear about the struggle of the people of Laos and also to hear their long story, which for us will be history. With these few words of introduction, uh, I hope you will enjoy this evening with us. And the Xavier Center loves to sponsor these kinds of programs and these kinds of lectures because the Xavier Center believes that history is more than merely narrating events of the past. It is about following people in their journey of life. Thank you very much and have a pleasant evening. Let me briefly introduce to you our speaker for today. Andrea Rodericks has over three decades of experience working on development challenges and opportunities around the world. Andrea has been increasingly drawn to exploring the complexity of these social, 
and uh, this uh, exploring the complexities of the issues and the behavioral social political and institutional forces that shape them she currently works independently with various development organizations and social movements andrea grew up in new delhi and has a bachelor's degree in economics from delhi university and a master's degree in public policy from the princeton school of public and international affairs she currently divides her time between goa in india and atlanta in the united in the united states and her link to her bio was sent to all of you you can further read about her in that so with these words of introduction i'd like to welcome our speaker this evening andrea rodricks over to you andrea thank you father anderson and thank you to xchr father tony i'm really happy to be here thank you all for joining good evening and good morning if it's morning where you are um i'm going to start my presentation by reading uh, an excerpt um from the book it's um it's a it'll last a few minutes but i'm hoping it will give you some context for um for what i share so bear with me um so what you see on the screen this is this is a young girl from laos she's 10 years old her name is lar l a r um and i'm reading about her school is out in 10 year old lars village at the northeastern edge of shenkwan province she sets off home her sister had stayed home today with a stomach ache as she walks on the path she hums the tune they they learned about medicinal herbs at their agrobiodiversity class at school there's one herb that cures stomach aches and her teacher said that it could be found in their village maybe she should look out for some for her sister on most days at this time of the year as lar and her sister walk home they search for broom grass that is ready for harvesting their mother has taught them where to look she always says look in the places where the land has been left fallow for a few years after the rice harvest or where the land was disturbed or burned as the fields on the hillside were planted with rice 3 years ago and allowed to return to nature the hillside is full of broom grass now lar can see some in the distance that looks ready for harvesting but she wants to take the path by the river today to look for the plant that cures stomach aches as she approaches the river she sees a small group of people animated in conversation sitting by the banks with charts and papers the conversation is being led by her 20 year old cousin pang this gets her courage to get closer as she nears the group her cousin calls her over but lar is shy and says she has to get home in a hurry she nevertheless did get close enough to overhear the subject of their conversation they were talking about an experiment they conducted in their fields and pang was carefully recording their findings on a chart it all looked very professional and lar is proud of her cousin she wants to be like her when she grows up Pang is a village facilitator in an agriculture project and she helps farmers learn from each other and from their own research. Lar goes on her way. A little further, she discovers an area that has some moisture and is full of different kinds of herbs. She imagines herself as a botanist searching for the perfect specimen. She takes out her notebook. She had carefully drawn the shape of the leaf at school, hoping it would help her recognize the herb she wants. But she can't see it anywhere. This is disappointing. After a while she decides to leave as her mother will be getting worried if she's not home soon. As she walks a short distance up the path, she suddenly spots that familiar shape of leaf. It's just perfect. She plucks some and rushes home. Lars's mother greets her as she enters and says, "I thought you'd returned with some broom grass today. There's a lot along the new road." Lars is worried that her mother's upset. She knows money is tight these days. perhaps she should have harvested some broom grass she sheepishly pulls out the herbs she's picked and explains to her mother their use her mother's disappointment disappears in an instant and her eyes light up she says we used to have this herb in the place where our village was located before the government moved us there was plenty of it all over the forest my grandmother was a herbalist then she sighs and says 
I feel bad I have not been able to teach you girls about the uses of these plants. I'm glad you're able to learn it at school. You have to show me where you found it. Maybe we can grow some. Yes, yes, I will show you, says Lark. But first, shouldn't we use it to make little sister better? Her mother smiles and begins to boil the herbs. What else did you learn today, she asks Lark. But Lark's mind is on something else. She has a faraway look in her eyes and she says, I want to learn to do what Peng does. Um, so that's part of um, a short vignette from the book. Um, and the book opens with these character vignettes. Uh, I'll show you some of the other characters. This is uh, Song Chan, and he's an elder in his village. He plays an active uh, role. Uh, if I may just interrupt you, Andrea, you're not yeah. sharing your screen. You need to share your screen with us. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. All right, do you see that? Yes, it's clear, Andrea. Thank Go ahead. you. All right. So uh, the, the little girl I was talking about, the 10-year-old, is Lara. And uh, you see her there on the left of your screen. Um, and I'm just telling you about some of the others. This is Samchan, who's an elder in his village. And um, he's, he plays quite an active role in uh, land use planning in their village. Um, we also see here Takwe. She's a farmer in the neighboring province. And we see here Bunmi. Um, he's an officer at the local district agriculture and forestry office. Um, and he has a reputation for being very responsive and is, has a, an aptitude for data and data analysis. So these are some of the characters in the book and I'm going to tell you more about their lives and, um, and their work. But before I do that, uh, I thought I'd show you a map of Laos um, just to get some context and a sense of where it is. Um, so here in the Northeast, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there are three provinces that have been outlined and um, Lar, whose story I read is from this one, Shenkhuang province. This is Huapan, this is Luang Prabang. And um, the story takes place in these three provinces. But this whole area, um, you know, it's a topographical map, so you can see where the, the um, where there's some mountains and the, the land is higher. This whole area is called the uplands. And it's quite a densely forested area. And it has a number of ecosystems, mountains, plateaus, plains, uh, rivers. It's quite, um, it's quite densely forested and um, kind of isolated in that respect. It used to be sparsely populated. You can also see from the map that Laos is uh, landlocked and it's surrounded by some very powerful economies. You can see Vietnam, China, Thailand. Uh, it's just got a sh short border with Myanmar and Cambodia down south. Um, the other point to note, I guess, is you know Laos, many of you might have heard about as a country that was very heavily bombed. Um, and this was during the Vietnam War, during the Cold War. Um, and this area where the story is set actually uh, was one of the heaviest bombed areas because the Ho Chi Minh travel ran, uh, trail ran through here. Uh, that shows my travel. Okay, I'm gonna talk a bit about um, biodiversity um, because that's the subject of the book. Um, and like the Western parts, this region is a biodiversity hotspot. It's the Indo-Burma hotspot. Um, and so when you hear descriptions of it, often you'll hear about all these different species, just like you hear about Goa. So eight to 11,000 11, species of flowering plants, 166 species of reptiles, amphibians, um, 500 species of fish, it's also got one of the greatest genetic pools of glutinous rice varieties, apparently second only to India in rice varieties. So it's, you know, it, it, it's very biodiverse. And even today, even though it's lost a lot of this biodiversity, it's still quite rich in biodiversity. Um, but I'm going to talk about a, a, a kind of biodiversity that we call agrobiodiversity. Um, and so I think biodiversity is well understood. Um, and agrobiodiversity, as the name suggests, 
is related to agriculture. So it's that interaction of people's cultivation, people's agriculture with their natural environments. Um, so it's a subset of biodiversity, you can say, and it's that part of biodiversity that's linked to sustainable agricultural practices. So that could be um, production, collection, example, collecting products from the forest or domesticating indigenous plants that you find in the forest on, you know, in a field. It could be uh, farmer cultivated crops or livestock that they rear or fish, but it's also natural plants, soil organisms, animals, um, and that live and evolve in, in, in these areas. And it also includes um, cultural and local knowledge of diverse species. Um, so this, this knowledge and culture is an important part when you think of agrobiodiversity. It's not just botany, it's also about that interaction and people's cultures. Now, this agrobiodiversity, this region has you know, stayed quite rich in agrobiodiversity because of certain practices that indigenous farmers have used in the region. And a lot of their practices are inspired by shifting cultivation. So some of you may have, may, may be familiar with it and some of you may not. So uh, let me say a little bit about shifting cultivation. Uh, we call it Jhum in Northeast India. Um, uh, Dahiar in some parts, I think Bundelkhan area, it's called Deepa in Bastar area. In Goa, it used to be called Kameri, uh, actually all along the Western Ghats. Um, and basically it's a method of growing crops where farmers will clear an area, of, they clear secondary forest. And uh, typically it's to grow rice. In this case, it's upland rice, not paddy rice. And after the harvest, they leave the land fallow and then they'll clear another plot uh, that they, they will select to cult cultivate the next crop. Now, during the time that the land is fallow, um, it will continually on its own evolve back to a forest uh, system. Um, and so they, they practice this as rotational cultivation in Laos. So you might have eight rotations. So you cultivate in an area, then you clear another area. That's your second rotation. You clear a third area and you go to go until eight. Um, when you, on, in the ninth year, you'll cultivate the area you first cultivated. But by then it would have been all those years, it would have grown into a secondary forest. Um, and the special thing about shifting cultivation is in, this, in these fallow lands, as it's evolving back to a forest, there's a lot of interaction. They, um, these farmers collect mushrooms, they might co collect broom grass, as you heard from Lars story. Uh, they might collect bamboo, um, other types of animals, plants. So it's a very important part of their lives. It revolves around these fallows. I'll just show you um, a few pictures. So this is uh, what you see in the foreground here. This is a young fallow. So they've probably just finished harvesting and it's, it's going to lie fallow. What you see a little further back here, that's um, um, maybe say a two-year-old fallow. So you can see the forest starting to, to, to come out there. Um, and I guess the key to understanding agrobiodiversity, I'm spending some time on this because um, it helps us understand what lies behind a lot of decision-making and a lot of people's experience. Um, so the key to understanding it is um, understanding the relationship to these fallows and what it means to people, the multiple uses they derive from it, how they, how they contribute to this kind of land. Um, it helps us understand their, their relationship to forests and to land. Um, and they might get medicine, they might get food, they might get building material from here. Uh, they might be able to collect things that they can sell and earn money from here. But these fallows also play important environmental functions. Um, like they, they, they offer services like carbon sequestration because they are like secondary forests. Um, they play a critical role in regenerating the fertility of the soil. Um, they play an important role in water provisioning, in sustaining, um, in sustaining water ecosystems, um, and also in maintaining sort of pest predator balances. 
Um, let's look at an older fallow. So this is the landscape from the areas I visited. You can see here in the center, that's kind of an older fallow, uh, probably a few years old in the foreground. It's a young one. In the distance, you see sort of little patches. That's, that's all been cleared pretty recently. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of the kinds of things people get from their fallows. And so on the left here, you see a list of just some of the things. There, there, there are the things they get to. So there's animals, organisms, plants, uh, trees and shrubs, flowers, orchids, mushrooms, um, and, and various other herbs, spices. Um, and you can see with, by these colors that, you know, where they might get it. So some of it is from the forest, some of it is from a riparian ecosystem, that means a, along a river. Um, some of it is from these fallows, the upland fallows, where they may have, um, you know, left the land to recover. And there are other areas like wetlands and, and other fields. This diagram on the right shows us um, how these fallows are important to their lives and livelihoods. So we can see the kind of income they earn from there. And for these upland uh, households, these indigenous farmers, they get about 48% of their income from, um, from that upland system, which is you know, fallows in different stages. They get about 10% from the forest um, and, and so on. But I think that the, the important thing isn't just about what they take, because for these indigenous communities, it's yes, they take and they benefit and use uh, these lands, but they also give and they sort of live quite symbiotically with, with this land. Uh, but this gives us a sense of why it's important, even economically. Um, so that's kind of all set up. And the reason why I wanted to explain that is, because, is really to get to a conversation on principles. Um, so I'm going to sort of go over a few principles that I realized in my research and in talking with farmers um, was important for them in their, in their agrobiodiversity practice and their farming practice, but that also influenced the way they live, the, you know, their lives in general, the decisions they made. And I think for me, when I look at what we can learn from them, it's really some of these underlying things, not so much the specific practices. So the first one is about, um, you know, everything they do evolves from the existing reality, their existing practices, but it's reality in, a, in quite a holistic way. So it's not just agriculture practices or technical things, it's their relationships, their cultures and beliefs, but that's always a starting point and it's always evolving. Um, there's great respect for broader values and knowledge systems. Um, and these knowledge systems or, or values that they hold have been passed down and evolved over generations. But, and again, it's not just technical. It could be experiential, it could be scientific, uh, it could be social and spiritual practices, uh, decision-making patterns. Um, the third one is around diversity and interconnectivity. and uh, honoring diversity. So agrobiodiversity, as, as we understand it, thrives on this diverse mix of crops um, and trees. And so these kind of symbiotic relationships, for example, a mushroom growing under a chestnut tree and understanding how that happens, this is very important to indigenous farmers. But it's also, you know, that whole principle of diversity and interconnectivity then permeates their, their lives and symbiotic relationships in general are very important, um, including between humans and other species. So it's not just about the symbiotic relationships between plants. Um, and then, uh, and, and also one of the things I have picked up sort of in these conversations is this symbiotic relationship across generations. So they understand what's passed down from the previous generation, what, um, what you want to leave behind and inspire future generations. Um, linking across scales, this is an interesting principle because it's, you might farm at a, a plot scale or you might 
you know, farm at, at different places in your village, but their consciousness always links to others. So they're always uh, aware of the wider watershed or the ecosystem. And, um, and it's quite incredible how they understand that so well, even people who've never left uh, their immediate village, uh, they'll never make a decision that might harm the, um, the watershed. Um, and this last principle about iterating, adapting, and innovating, it's a very important part of, of their life. Um, with rotational agriculture, you're iterating, right? So with each rotation, you, you try out something new, you might innovate, you might adapt it. And because you're able to constantly experiment in that way, you can keep learning and growing and changing. So now nobody said to us, um, oh, these principles are really important and this is how we do our agriculture. But as in our action research, as we talked to people, we noticed time and again that conversation kept coming back to these principles. Um, and not just as you know, agricultural practices, but how they live their lives. And so the book does this as well. The book that I wrote keeps coming back to these principles. And um, we, we started to see that it just comes back again and again. And so I, I'm, I'm going to do that in this presentation as well. Um, so moving on, this is again, just a picture of a landscape. You can see what it looks like in the distance there, you see sort of different types of fallows. Some are more mature, where it's darker green, some are um, uh, newly cleared land. You can see the village down here. So those hills at the back are probably where they farm. Um, I'm not going to read this prayer, but um, it gives you a sense of the kind of um, relationship they have to the forest and to their land. And before, before they, they plant it or before they take a hill for planting, they ask uh, the land, they say, please lend us the land and forest. We vow to return them after the harvest. So it's very much, even though they might farm that land for years and years and keep coming back to it when it rotates back, um, it's still, it's still not theirs to own and hold. It's, they're, they're borrowing it from nature. And so they say, oh, forest spirits, oh, mountain spirits, please help us celebrate a great harvest. Um, it's a Kamu prayer. Kamu is the tribe that Lar, the little girl I talked about, is from. Now, um, so that's a little bit about um, the practices and some of the principles that are important to indigenous farmers. Um, now, shifting cultivation itself, as many of you might know, is quite controversial. Uh, in, it is in India, in many countries it is. Um, and so it was in Laos too, and still is in, uh, for some people. Um, and until the mid 1970s or so, you know, this region was quite isolated and it wasn't even integrated so well into state decision making. Um, but then as the government, as this new country started to uh, want to end poverty and wanted to be seen as they didn't want to be a least developed country anymore. Um, they wanted to they wanted to have planning that applied to the whole country. Um, and there's very much a perception among policymakers almost everywhere uh, that shifting cultivation is backward and associated with poverty and low levels of productivity and environmental degradation or deforestation. So they see that as an impediment to biodiversity and conservation goals. Um, and so the Lao government also had that view and they aimed to eradicate shifting cultivation and they wanted people to move to a more sedentary system. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that transition is like. Uh, so it wasn't just the eradication of shifting cultivation, that period also coincided with the economy opening up. So you had these powerful countries surrounding Laos doing very well um, and the Lao government wanting to be more integrated into the regional economy, wanting to be a more developed country. Um, and so we, we talk about it in development as the agrarian transition uh, where countries start to open up to markets and we look at what happens with agriculture. Um, and particularly in, in this area, after the signing of the Paris Peace Accord, um, the Mekong region, that whole region sort of emerged as 
um, an area of global significance. It was very rich in natural resources and it was kind of seen as the last uh, economic frontier of Asia. And so the government was embracing that, that development and they started to make you know, really important strides and commitments around poverty reduction, around um, what, kind, what percent of forest cover they wanted. Um, and you know they signed on to the SDGs, and so their policies at that time. Then they wanted to be very clear that they used land efficiently, and so they focused on their policies focused on a separation between land that was for conservation and land that was for agriculture. So conservation land they thought should be left to forest. You should not um, you should not interfere. You should not intervene there. You should not go in there. And agricultural land should be more intensively used, sort of in 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 a more growth oriented uh, way. This is obviously quite different to the kind of agriculture that uh, these ind indigenous farmers are used to. And so, when you start to see land as as capital, um, then the kinds of investments that were possible so the, there was encouragement to sort of move to more monoculture type of agriculture so plantations of rubber maize sugarcane cassava so you can see in this picture um, that's part of a banana plantation on the right you can see maize um, on the top there you can see hydropower so they, there are a lot of rivers in this region and they would like to you know be able to be a supplier of electricity to these cities in the Mekong region um, and so they're foreign leases and um, concessions for foreign investors to come in and set up some of these um, um, some of these plantations or uh, to build some of this infrastructure so they're trying to um, trying to develop as traditionally countries develop. Um, they also wanted to be able to uh, deliver development better. And so um, they tried to concentrate populations because the area was quite sparsely populated, but this meant they moved people. So they moved villages in some cases, whole villages just to be closer to the infrastructure so that they could have better development services. Um, what did this mean for people though? So we heard from um, Lars mother about, you know, how their village used to move and they lost some of those ancestral lands. Um, I've got here a very messy slide uh, and it's messy because this transition is messy and I'm not going to, to read it all, but here are some of the ways in which people adapted to that. Um, those who had some something saved up and could invest in commercial agriculture might have done so. They might have, you know, use their land for maize instead of practicing shifting cultivation. Uh, those who could afford to, um, you know, cultivate paddy rice because that's, that's lowland rice and, um, you know, you can get more, more yield on um, in these paddy fields. But also, you know, the kind of agriculture that was being pursued, for example, in maize fields, it required a lot of inputs and a fertilizer to sustain that production. So the landscape starting to get a bit more toxic. So you read a lot about the toxic landscape in, in Laos. Um, now, the, the government was building infrastructure, which is a good thing. It was reaching to villages and this made it easier for them to get to markets, but it also made it easier for, for children to get to schools. Um, it also made it easier for traders from Vietnam and China to come in and um, you know, find ways to, to buy these natural resources. So the kind of uh, lifestyle is changing and what people are, you know, what the, the main work of people's livelihoods is shifting. Um, young people, when they, they were exposed to the wider world. Many of them wanted to earn money. They wanted to, um, to migrate for work. Um, and then remittances would be used to invest back into agriculture. Um, but even through all these changes, a lot of people still tried to keep a foot in, in rotational agriculture. So they did some shift in cultivation. They did some collection from their forests. Um, and so you, you got quite sort of a mix of activity. A family could have one person in the city, um, say running a small shop, another in Thailand um, doing manual labor. Um, they didn't have much labor um, on the farm. And so they, they were shifting, they were domesticating some species they may have got from the forest. Uh, they started rearing cattle because it needed less labor. 
Um, so they have this kind of on-farm, off-farm strategies and their lives are changing a lot. But also what's happening is those who stayed in shifting cultivation and couldn't afford to, to diversify in this way uh, weren't doing so well because when you have few rotations and it's and less land under under rotation, um, you're not as productive. And then that reinforces the view that shifting cultivation is just not very good. Um, then there were also changing food practices and preferences, people starting to buy fast food and not able to get to the kind of food they used to traditionally eat. Um, but I think when you look across it, you know, there's good things, there's bad things. Um, and, the, and, and these populations at the end of the day were able to sort of diversify, balance various approaches, and many of them actually stayed resilient because they were able to do this. So when we talk about navigating the transition, one of the things that stays with me was how able they were to, um, you know, to play with this complexity. Um, so in 2009, I'm, I'm sort of going to get to now what, um, what kinds of work was done to support agrobiodiversity. So with the realization that there was losses in biodiversity, with the realization that we were going to lose a lot of the knowledge that had come down generations, um, the government made a decision with support from um, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation to invest in agrobiodiversity, to understand what it was that people were doing, how they were, you know, what species were important to them, how they were innovating. Um, and so they, they started this um, initiative called the Agrobiodiversity Initiative. And that's, the, the book is really about that initiative. Um, and one of the key things that they did early on was to look at forest and land use planning. Um, now, Laos, a country, had done a lot of land use planning in the past, um, but this was going to be different. Um, this is just a picture of people sort of looking at a map and trying to figure out uh, the village boundaries. But they wanted to do for the agrobiodiversity initiative wanted to do forest and land use planning differently to what had been done before. So it had typically been sort of quite a top down process that was really intended to meet policy objectives. So you roll it out in a village. Um, but what they wanted to do was really understand agrobiodiversity practices and how these populations had sustained uh, that level of biodiversity. And so these are some of the things they did differently. For one is the, the process was designed to be bottom up and collaborative and participatory. So you had a team of that made up of government um, officers, the land use planners and communities work on their forest and land use plan. Um, they began their process by mapping the existing uh, use of their lands and forests. Um, and it was an iterative process. Instead of just going in and having people plan in a hurry as most processes had been, they decided to do an iterative process over two years. So this team would go back to the same villages three times. Um, they used satellite imagery and got people working with maps. Um, they also did something quite interesting, which was they were doing planning at a village level, but they worked with all the sets of villages in a cluster. A cluster is an administrative unit. So what that also meant was they were able to sort out any conflicts in village boundaries. And then you could kind of zoom in into a village, but also zoom out and look at how, um, you know, how the plan looked across a whole cluster and then zoom further out and look at it across a district. So there were many kind of interesting things that they did um, that hadn't been done before in forest and land use planning. Um, when so they would plot the existing land use, then communities would think about what they wanted to do in future, uh, and they would build a plan for the future how how they would use their forests and lands, and then they would get the local authorities to endorse them. So even though you didn't, you might not have had a title, or you might not have had all your formal papers, you did have your local authority endorsing it, which was which was something important. Um, and then they would, all of this data, all of the maps would be returned to communities. And I'll show you a picture where, you know, they put these big boards in communities with, uh, with the maps. So anytime 
a conflict came up or somebody wanted to know something about how their land was being used, you could go to the board. This is Sam Chan, who um, I told you is one of the characters in the book. And um, I'll just read, um, he, he tells a much longer story in the book, but this gives us some sense of what is important uh, to him. So he says, during the team's next visit, they helped us zone our forest and agricultural land and prepare a management plan for the future. We agreed on areas for paddy fields, areas for cattle grazing, where we would locate our upland rotational agriculture fields to allow for six rotations. Water in our streams had been decreasing and we decided to protect a larger area around the streams as a natural buffer. Even though this means giving up some agricultural land, it is good for the water and also helps us get access to some traditional foods and herbs. We coordinated with the neighboring villages so that buffer zones could join up across the border. We marked all the forests, the old growth forests, the areas we would leave for regrowth, as well as the areas we would use to gather mushrooms and food. Some families had earlier started to farm in the forest and they agreed to use the rotational field instead. So you're getting a sense of some of the the thinking, the things they're thinking about that are way beyond this is my plot of land and this is what I'm going to do on it. Um, let's think about as a result what happened. So this process went on for years, as you can imagine, if you're going to go three times to every village. Um, but it has produced something quite incredible in across the uplands. They've mapped existing land uses. And uh, importantly, they've put shifting cultivation on the, on the map. So they can see what it's being used for. They can show in which, on which, in which ways it is productive. Um, and they can stabilize it uh, because the government often talked about stabilizing versus eradication. They also created a database of species, of local innovation, of livelihood opportunities that are now shareable and available on platforms for people to access. Um, they consolidated their rotational fields, maybe I'll, uh, that's a bit of detail, maybe we can get into later. Um, and most people think if you leave people to plan that they, they'll, they won't leave the forests alone, they'll, you know, put most of the land toward agriculture. But interestingly, what happened as you look across the area and all the land use plans, they actually devoted more area to forest than was there earlier. They, they devoted 9.6% more to forests, which is quite an incredible thing. Um, and so this also sort of started to change the perception of the practices of these communities. Um, I'll just point out one thing here, which is this planning at landscape scale. So the map you see is the map of a district. Um, and sort of, so we've zoomed out and we've got all the, the land use plans map, mapped there. And you can see those black lines which show connectivity corridors and movement pathways. So even though each village was just planning for itself, it was still you know, really aware of how it connected to the next village's forests or how animals would move, how they would get to the river, um, what the link was between the old original forest and these areas and, um, and where there was you know, full connectivity and where there could be partial connectivity. Um, so just, that's just to point out a few, you know, a few things that happened as a result of this kind of planning. Um, and, I think importantly, this whole process also made people feel that, you know, what they were doing, their practices weren't bad per se. Um, they, could, they were able to show how they contributed to forestry goals as well. Um, I put some of these um, principles back here. I'm not gonna go over them again because um, what I began to see as we were doing this research was um, it was these principles that led to the kind of land use planning that, that we saw, uh, that led to them thinking across scales, that led to them really starting from where people were honoring knowledge systems over generations, that led to this iterative process. Uh, beyond land use planning, I'm just gonna show you a bunch of pictures. Now they also invested in agro-biodiversity driven livelihoods. So 
species and activities that people thought were important emerged from the land use plans and then they started to make small investments in this so you can see bamboo shoots here at the the road market they've also got a very particular kind of bamboo shoot called norloi that's special and only grown in uh, only emerges in certain uh, certain areas and so this there's a you know high demand for it because you can use it for straws um, they, they made these fish conservation zones agreeing not to fish in certain areas so that some of these local varieties of fish could breed uh, and then made them sort of tourist destinations so people would visit them. You see here local oranges um, and because many people, you know, shifting cultivation also takes a lot of labor. So many people on their own were stopping to do that, but they were able to innovate and draw some of these species from shifting cultivation fields or get things from, um, from, from the forest and try experiments with domesticating them. So this shed you see on the right, that's tea. They've got this thousand year old species of tea that's really valuable in China. And so they they started to build these little tree nurseries um, from this the tea that was um, that, that they got from the forest. These oranges are local oranges that maybe some of them came from Vietnam at first, but interestingly, Vietnam can no longer doesn't have organic oranges and traders come across the border for these. Um, here you see mushrooms. Um, they, they were managing their collection of mushrooms and collecting them in a sustainable way. On the right, this is also a very valuable mushroom. Again, the Chinese um, come across the border for it and they taught them how to dry it. So they started to interact with these traders in very interesting ways. The traders would teach them skills, but then they, they were trying to um, market them on their own terms as well. Um, this is These are crystals of benzoin crystals from the Styrax tree that used in uh, France for perfumes. This is river algae in the market, a special kind of rice, the little chicken rice that's, uh, that they invested in and uh, to create clean seed systems. Anyway, those are just um, some, uh, some things that they supported. Um, a little bit before we end on just what the future holds. Everywhere we went, we asked people what 2030 looked like. Uh, so we had many conversations about 2030. Um, a lot of people would say, I want my children to be in Vientiane, which is the capital, or have a good government job in town. Um, and that was seen as the traditional path. Most young people wanted to leave. But interestingly, through this work, many of them would say, well, my parents want me to do this, but I want to do that. So my parents want me to be a doctor, but I want to be a tour guide. I'll show people how beautiful the space is. Um, and so we, there's some more um, quotes here of, of what people, how they see the future. Um, this one in the middle says, in 2030, agrobiodiversity careers will be more than farmers and government officers. They will include action researchers, entrepreneurs, teachers, traders, designers, ecotour operators, heritage chefs, herbalists, network hosters. And again, here you're seeing that principle of interconnectedness across all these different trades. Uh, this one on the right says the dominant identity of the uplands will be as a hub for green agriculture, unique and rich in agrobiodiversity, and a generator of ecosystem services in the region. On the left, they say Pakhao Lao, this is a digital platform that they created, which has all of their you know, data about the species that were important to them. But it's just a digital platform and database for now and a website and they're saying in the future it will be a platform that shapes connections and dialogue across levels from organism to landscape from farmers to policymakers and markets so these are sort of young educated people with a vision for for this area um all right i'll just wind down um in the book um we have these couple of landscapes that we drew uh, where you can go on a walk um, with farmers. So you read about the walk and you can follow it in the sketch and um, it tells us about the kinds of plants that are important to them, the activities they're engaged in, some of the dilemmas they face, how things are changing, what their dreams are for the future. And, you know, it just, the diagram gives you a sense of the picture. So what does this mean? for, you know, what do I take away from it? And how is it relevant to anyone else beyond Laos? Um, and 
you know, I think different people can take away different things. Um, but I, I thought I would reflect on what sticks with me. Um, and one of the most important things I think that stays with me beyond, you know, all of the beautiful experiences and conversations um, and songs that I heard um, is this, um, this thing of being able to overcome the binary choices. You know, so we, we are often faced with what I mean by binary choices where you, you're asked to choose, well, is it this or that? Do you, are you going to be a subsistence farmer or are you going to do commercial agriculture? Um, actually, these farmers found a way to, to, to do them both. They did some subsistence, but in, in the binary views, commercial agriculture was, you know, these large commercial farms, monocrops, uh, a lot of inputs, but they're able to earn and do commercial agriculture um, by mixing what they knew as subsistence farmers and um, getting to market. This other thing about conservation or agricultural land. What land is this? Uh, again, a, a very binary choice. And here we, we see that they're able to, through agrobiodiversity, there's certain lands that are just purely for conservation and nobody will go in. Then they were able to show that in their land use maps. But there's certain ones that in which they, they work and they, they, they're conserving them. They have secondary forests, but they also use them for agriculture. Um, and you know, it also reminds me of the fight we are in here in Goa. You know, when you say don't fragment the Molay forest, uh, you'll often get people say back to you, well, uh, so you don't want development, but those are not your choices. There's, there's a lot more there you can think of. Um, same thing with uh, as, as development people will say, you know, is this an urban enterprise, is it a rural enterprise? Actually, the enterprises we're seeing emerging in, in Laos are urban and rural. They have a couple of members in urban areas linked to some market and they have other people in rural areas and they're linked to other. So it's kind of like networks of enterprises. Uh, will young people stay in rural areas or will they leave? Oh, we must make them stay. You know, that their projects to keep young people in rural areas. But, you know, again, it's not it's not just a choice once in your life. And it's not that you, you have to do one or the other. You can actually leave and come back if somebody supports you too, or there's investments. And so that's kind of, I felt the conversation that was emerging. In my mind, I feel that a lot of that way of thinking, being able to overcome the binary comes from these principles. Uh, you must be tired of me talking about the principles, but um, I do think when you start to think about symbiotic relationships, when you start to see yourself as part of that bigger natural world, it, it just helps you think differently. So then when I think of, well, for Goa, what, what do we take? You could take away many different things. You could you know, take, share agrobiodiversity practices. You could share some of the information on land use planning, or we could look at, you know, there's a lot of agrobiodiversity based livelihood work going on here, and there could be some nice sharing. But for me, what's more interesting is, you know, at the end of the day, we need to think about what's the nature of development we want. It's not sort of each individual fight, but uh, can principles like this, principles of agrobiodiversity, or say principles that are drawn from our comunidad or Kazan system, can these kinds of principles help us frame, overcome this kind of binary type of choice making that we sometimes do? So that's a question. I don't know, maybe you can answer. Uh, the other thing I'm wondering is can principles of agrobiodiversity inspire the way we come together? So for example, if we're really thinking about interconnectedness or honoring our knowledge systems, when we come together, would we give some attention to them? Uh, and when I mean we, I mean you know, people who come together to think about development. Um, how would we think about linking across scales? I mean, those, if there's anyone here from Canada or, or New Zealand, um, when you go to a meeting um, in Canada, you always honor the ancestors that came before you on whose land that was. So what if we started to do things like that, looked at connectivity across gen generations, just in simple ways in our everyday conversations, could those principles actually you know, become the connective tissue that helps us create this, this shared vision. And I think in Goa, because there's so much going on, there's so much bubbling up at the moment, they're entrepreneurs, they're young people with their art, there's a lot of interest in the forest, but maybe, you know, the time is right for some of these conversations to come together and could 
you know, framing, articulating some principles help us um, help, help us take that challenge forward. Uh, I'm going to close. This is Remember La at the start of the, the presentation. Um, I, the book ends in 2030 and La is 20 years old. This is her, you don't have to read the text that's there, but she's playing a very, um, uh, it, it, it's an important role. She's still young, so it's not like she's in charge of everything, but she's playing an important role in this platform that started off as a digital platform, which has now grown into a platform that connects people, creators, farmers, young people, experts, scientists, and, um, there's a story, a graphic story that is, um, it's five pages long right at the end. And it it just paints that picture of these connections and relationships and the kind of um, the kind of development that people hope emerges from this region. Um, so thank you. That's that's all I'll, I'll share for now. Um, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea, for that beautiful presentation. Excellent, excellent presentation from you. Thanks, thanks for that. You stress a lot on the regenerative principles of agrobiodiversity, and I think that's going to stick with us. Um, you also showed us how indigenous people have so much to teach us. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, I'll, I'll, what I'll do now is I'll throw the floor open for questions for a discussion. Since we are not too many, I would request anybody who has a question to, you can unmute yourselves and throw a question to Andrea or any of us and we'll try to we'll try to get this discussion going uh, before that there's a there's a question from Frederick about is this book available in any library in Goa uh, the simple answer is yes it is available at the Xavier Center and this is the book in case you're interested you're most welcome to the center it's a beautiful publication I'm sure it'll inspire you Anyone, anyone with a question or a doubt, a query, can throw it to Andrea. It's a lot to take in. Um, you can also get the book online. Um, I think the original announcement had, um, had the link. If not, I, I can send it. Thanks. Uh, Andrea, there's a question in our chat box asked by Frederick once again. He asks, why has shifting agriculture got a bad press in Goa too? Is it all that bad as made out to be? What do you think? So um, I think it's, yeah, not just in Goa, in, in most places in the world, it's been quite controversial. Um, and, you know, there are many it's a practice that evolves. And I, and I think because it, it's been evolving over time, people make a lot of assumptions about it. There is a form of shifting cultivation that um, is, you know, people taking on original, so they're not doing a rotation necessarily, but they're moving. So they, um, they keep taking on original forest areas and, you know, um, that has a bad reputation. When populations were low, that didn't matter so much, but if, if people continue to do that now, it would decimate forests. Uh, however, most places in the world, mo most indigenous communities are doing rotational shifting cultivation. And I think that's not always clearly understood. Um, the, the other thing is, you know, it, um, people talk about, well, the, the level of effort that needs to go in. So I think if you try to understand it just as an agricultural practice, it's sometimes seen as inefficient. You need to understand it in its sort of in a more holistic way. Um, so, for example, in Laos, people would say, "Well, it, it's it's you know there isn't so much food security for these populations because they only see rice as food security." So, but these you ask people what they eat. You like when we went and visited people, we'd say, "What are you, you going to have for lunch?" And they'd name like twelve different things. Um, I'm not saying they're fully food secure. But I think it's just important to understand the meaning of it and what it means in people's lives more, more holistically. Um, the, the other controversies are around just, you know, land wanting to be taken over for um, industry, you know, commercial interests or private companies. I mean, there's pressure from everywhere, there's pressure from the neighboring countries in Laos to, to plant more maize. 
because you know they've run out of land space and they want to be able to to get it from these countries um, and here too you know the, there are interests business interests that are promoting a particular kind of agriculture and so that's competition thanks thanks andrea for that response uh, does anyone else have a question for andrea uh, Tony, Tony, you can unmute yourself and speak. Yeah, Andrea, I was wondering, you know, about the situation in Goa. You you see this, of course, when you travel anywhere in Goa. There is so much of land, fields available for cultivation, but they are not cultivated, as you know very well. And they have not been cultivated for many years now, unfortunately, I think. Now, what, what is your assessment of this kind of thinking? Because you've spoken mostly about how the people in Cambodia, in, in uh, Laos, sort of are making efforts to cultivate and to grow more food. But here it seems that is not the situation. Now, what, what went wrong? Something went wrong somewhere that the farmers do not want to cultivate and the land is lying fallow and the industrialists are coming in and occupying all that to no advantage of the Goans, of the local people. And I think in the long run will be disastrous for the biodiversity. Would you have a reflection on that? Yeah. Um... I think it's true, and and I think the the question, at least for me, and you know, I, I don't, I don't really, I haven't talked to people in Goa about this very much, but I think it comes down to the, the nature of development we we want and see. Um, so I think the first thing to find out is well, why aren't people cultivating that land? Um, is it because they left? Is it because they left because they thought there was no point in uh, trying to make a living here? Or is it because it's been taken over by some other interests? Um, is it because we haven't had, a, you know, if you don't see any importance in it and it's just easier for you to get your food and things from elsewhere, you might choose to, you might choose to, you know, not do such hard work because it is very hard work. Um, I think though that, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, conversations here are, are now turning to understanding biodiversity more and the threats to it in Goa. I don't know if conversations around that can lead to a greater interest. Um, maybe somebody else, maybe I mean, Praganza can talk about you know, farmers for future. Are they seeing ways to inspire um, people to use their land in different ways? So I guess I'm saying, I don't know, but I, I do think there's a there's a need to think about not just specific plans, not just specific proposals, let's do this, let's do that, but what is the nature as a whole we want in Goa? Um, so it's not just about the regional plan, but you know, that's why I, I talked about principles. What are the principles we want to play out in the future and development? Maybe Thanks. someone else has a better answer to that though. I mean, I don't think there is any perfect answer, but uh, it creates at least a reflection. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Andrea. Uh, any last? Qu uh, there is there is one question from Mingel Braganza. Uh, what? Uh, and this probably will be our last question. What is the kind of policy support needed to allow people to plan land use? What do you think, Andrea? Yeah, I, well, I can talk um, from context that I know. Um, and it's really being, you know, making sure you're using your data. So for example, uh, in, in this case, in, in Laos, they, uh, they've had a lot of land use planning over the years, but it, it was really just an exercise to, to um, implement policy. But when they started to do it in more uh, participatory ways, not only did they get a better product, I think, but they've started to create this relationship between policymakers or, um, you know, government officers who are interested in, in, in land use and people. So 
you know, something that makes that interaction happen or accountabilities um, grow between these different stakeholders is really important, I think. Um, and then also just um, using what we come up with. So, so here we have biodiversity management committees at a, at a village level. Um, now that is kind of leading to some kind of planning conversations, but I guess for us to think, how do we use that? How do we make it valuable? How do we make everyone want to see their biodiversity management committee records? Um, so just creating interest, um, you know, even if it's not putting a lot of money into these processes, but really using, creating interest. So those are two ingredients. Um, I'm sure, you know, the, there's many more that can, um, but I would say, you know, participation, building relationships in the process is, is one of the most important. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea, for that beautiful response. I think we could we could have this conversation going. This is just a this is just a starting point. And anybody who would like to contact Andrea, Andrea has also given us her details in the flyer that I've put out. I think you can always contact her, take her on board for any policy making in case it's needed. So I think we'll close on this note. And thanks a lot, Andrea, for that beautiful presentation. Very picturesque. It was as though we were making a tour of Southeast Asia. Beautiful, beautiful. You explained to us the principles and about the wisdom of these indigenous people. Thanks a lot, Andrea, and God bless you. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye, take care. And our next history hour will be in a couple of weeks time on the 26th, 26th of November. More about that will be sent out to you by email or WhatsApp. So stay tuned, stay tuned, and all the best to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.